Well, welcome everyone to another conversation. And today I'm joined with, with Jonathan Wilson, who's in the UK with us, and we've coordinated our time frames thanks to Zoom. And I'd just like to say a big warm welcome, Jonathan. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you very much. It's nice to be with you. Yeah. Um, you're actually, you, you've had an interesting background. You were a, a police officer for many years and then had an experience of workplace bullying that was pretty horrible. Would you like to tell us just a little bit about your background and, and how you entered the police service and, you know, your role there? Okay, yeah, I mean, I, mean, I, <clears throat> I joined the police in, in 1988. Um, I joined the police in London. I was originally from the Midlands, Stratford-upon-Avon. Um, I wanted to go into the police, but I wanted to go somewhere where, you know, life was a little bit more exciting than um, than uh, quiet Stratford-upon-Avon. So I applied to join the police in London, and I went down there. And I, I'm forever grateful for what I did, you know, because um, my my perspective of the world was enhanced greatly, you know, because it's such a large multicultural society. Um, I saw so much more diversity um, and a broader range of um, incidents, I suppose, in the police, you know, which is interesting for me because, again, I, I, I spent, before any of this happened to me, the, the bullying, I'd served for about 26 years. Um, and I thought with everything that I'd seen in life, I was resilient to everything because I'd seen a lot. Um, you know, I'd been in riots. I'd seen all of the horrible incidents, you know, you expect police would, police officers would um, encounter and some of the more um, um, vicious and cruel people in life, but, but also some um, incredible compassion, but, you know, from, from police officers, from other public sector workers, and also just from members of the public. Um, so I, I, I spent um, quite a few years, probably, um, I had about 10 years service as a, a police constable before I, I took promotion. Um, and then I, I, I went up through the ranks um, and I eventually got to the rank of detective superintendent. Um, I was, um, I worked on some strategy around the um, organized crime when working with the home office nationally. Um, I was the deputy commander on um, the National Olympic Intelligence Center and then I went into a unit um, I was posted into a unit um, which I, I won't identify because of what happened there but I, all I will say is it's a very very high profile unit um, that dealt with some very very um, some of the most uh, some of the most serious types of policing you can imagine um, and unfortunately, it had a culture of um, a, 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 couple, a, cult, a thread of nepotism running through it. You know, some people who'd been there for too long or people being recruited in there who, who were known by people in there already, etc. So it was very much of a case of people known. I guess I went in as a bit of an outsider because I got posted there, not through, not through choice or any effort on my half um, mm. or anyone necessarily from within advocating me being there and so did was was that part of the problem that you know you weren't part of the inner circle that had been you know recommended for the job you came in as an outsider so therefore you were someone to watch um i think that may have been i mean a couple of people said how come you know i did have a couple of people say how come you've come here you know um we'd got someone in mind for this role but I think one of the bigger problems was the fact that because I hadn't gone in on this sort of, I suppose, unspoken contract of being in the in crowd, when I got there, I saw certain things that were wrong, you know, things that policy that across the whole of the organization um, was set out that weren't being followed within the, that, 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 that particular command. People felt, you know, managers there who'd been there for too long felt it was okay to do things the way they wanted and not necessarily, necessarily according to policy. And of course, you know, um, I'm very meticulous about what's wrong and right um, and what's fair. 
So I spoke up and I challenged a few things. And as a superintendent, which is quite a senior rank, I felt quite comfortable being able to do it. You know, it wasn't as if I was a junior officer. It was your job. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I felt I felt comfortable doing it. And I also, they were sort of quite, because they, there were quite a few people who'd been there for probably for too long and had an experience of other types of policing, just that type of policing, there was a very much an attitude of, this is, we're going to do things the way we've all, always done it um, uh, and maintain the status quo. And again, I was challenging that status quo. One of the, the, the role that I'd been brought in to do was actually to bring some life into a, a, a particular area of police work that um, had not necessarily, necessarily had the attention and, and the drive that it had um, it, that it required. So there was a bit of resistance there because of the work that I was trying to bring in, I needed to integrate in with the, the work of the other areas of the command. And there was some resistance at um, management level as well. So, so in your mind, when I talk to other um, bullying victim survivors, you were just doing your job, just, you know, picking up on things that hadn't been done properly. Yes. Yes, I was. I mean, it's so common. People don't set out <laughs> to rock the boat in a way that they have their health destroyed. They just are doing their jobs. Yeah. And I, 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 I think, I think that um, what happened was that they, they basically saw, you know, this is maybe why they recruit, you know, they like to recruit their own people so they don't get those sort of challenges and stuff. And I probably, yeah. I was seen very much as um, an inconvenience. Um, so I think that was probably the catalyst um, for what started to happen, which I didn't recognise was happening at the time. Yeah. So, so very, I, very subtle and covert. Yeah, so that's what I was going to ask without going into too much detail. How did the bullying play out for you? Was it being left out of situations, isolated, rumour mongering, mongering, those sorts of things? Okay, so there were two two principal bullies. One is I had a manager, first of all, who'd, who I'd put quite a few challenges in with. And then there was uh, someone who was a, a peer who had worked within another area area within that command and the integration of my work impacted on that person's work but the integration of my work was being government driven and I had to push it forward um, and I think they were resistant to it um, and they were resistant to some kinds some kinds of operational work that that our team got involved in um, where we we're getting successes that they hadn't necessarily um, hadn't seen as worthwhile, and those successes had been quite productive. Um, so the manager that I, I had was doing things like um, taking had no interest in the work that I did unless he had to go and brief senior officers, and then he would get me down to spend an, an hour or so briefing him before he went to see senior officers. Um, and sometimes if, for instance, when we had to go and see the commissioner together before the commissioner met the prime minister, we, um, he, he, I spent an hour briefing him on all the work we'd done. And then he said, when we went into the meeting, don't say anything unless you were asked, I'm going to present it all. Now he hadn't had no interest in it. And he would do things like, um, I'd find that I'd had resources like staff taken away from me or um, funding taken away from me but it wouldn't I wouldn't have been told I wasn't told that it was only when I um, had you know some of my staff had moved on and I went through um, the human resources to try and recruit in more staff and I was suddenly told no you haven't got those staff anymore that was taken away from you about three months ago so there was this sort of subtle type of stuff there was stuff like um, and this is some of the things that I challenged as well um, performance development reviews um, which again, it, it shows the lack of interest in the work. Um, I'd be told before a performance development review um, to send him an email with work that I'd done over the last 12 months, you know, examples of work that I'd done over the last 12 months. Then he would cut and paste that into my performance or a pricey version of that into my performance development review and give me a score. Now that, that would be my performance development review. And I, of course, the natural question for me was, 
where's the development? You know, have you identified some talent for me? And he couldn't tell me. And they also used a mechanism for chief inspectors of above called um, a performance and potential matrix, which is like a, a, you know, two axes on a graph with a nine box grid. And one would be performance and one would be potential. And the first time I saw him for that, he gave me a score. And I said, well, you know, I'm not disagreeing with the score, but can you provide me with a rationale for why it's there? So I can understand where I, my strength, where you perceive my strengths and weaknesses are. Um, and it was nervous laughter. And I was told to go and say, you know, he, I needed to see his boss about it. And I said, but he's not my line manager. You are. You're supposed to be telling me this. You know, you're, you're giving me this. Um, so there's those sorts of challenges. And also, obviously, you know, the inclination from it was just the total disinterest with the work that I was doing. I very rarely saw him apart from meetings. And I had real problems with him as well, because a lot of my work involved working across government um, with some, you know, with the Home Office, with the Department for Education, with the Department for Health, um, with um, chief executives of local authorities. Um, and some, quite often I'd have to go to meetings with multi agencies or multi government departments. Sometimes those would clash with his once a week um, catch up with all of his, you know, the people who reported to him. So occasionally those meetings were really important. And he, he was saying to me, you can't go to those. My meetings are more important. So his meetings were just where we gave a brief, brief overview of statistics over the last week. Um, so occasionally I'd send, um, I'd send my deputy to those because it was quite important with these partners that I was at those meetings. And, and he was just basically put a stop to that and said, you can tell them to reschedule them. My meetings are more important. Well, there was no understanding of that partnership working. Again, I think that was from being too long in that sort of thing. Um, and eventually he was temporarily promoted. So he put in a, one of my peers into that position. And this is where some of the really covert, insidious and deniable behavior started. He was literally on, and this was, he, this was probably a year after I'd been enrolled that this individual was put into hit that position of being my lion manager. And within one or two days of being put into that position, he called me down to his office or he got uh, his um, personal assistant to say, can you come down and see him? And I went into the office, there was no one else there, the door was shut and he said, um, I've had two of your managers, the, the, two of the managers that work for you have come to me to say um, they don't like the way you speak to them and they're thinking about leaving. And I'm totally shocked. And I said, could you please give me some context? You know, who is it? You know, because I'm horrified if this has happened. I can't see where it's happened. Could you give me some context so I can understand? No, they don't want to be identified. Well, could you give me some context about what was said? No, because that would identify them. So you just sorted out was the response. Um, I had this happen several times over the next few months. I was called in to be told that other people um, were upset. I'd upset. I didn't like the way that I spoke to them. And again, never any context, etc. Funnily enough, none of this had happened in the 12 months before he arrived in position. And I wondered how suddenly all of these people had had suddenly decided when he was in position that they had the confidence to go and speak to him. He wasn't exactly necessarily the person, sort of person that would people see as the most friendly and approachable individual, you know, and, and well known to people to go and talk to about that. Um, and eventually it started to dawn on me that this was sort of a myth because he, uh, I had to, I was taken by an assistant commissioner to give a briefing to the then mayor, who's now our prime minister about work and other government departments didn't want that to happen. And I'd said to those other government departments who I had a good relationship with, I can't stop it. You need to speak to the assistant commissioner because she's my boss. Um, so the meeting went ahead. She then left the organization um, and that boss is now the commissioner of the police, but she left the organization at the time. And after she'd left, he called me into another one of these ambush meetings that were deniable and no one else was there to say, 
the Home Office and other agencies, so they can't work with you um, because you go, you know, you go against um, um, what you know, working in partnership. You held this meeting with when and briefed the mayor were against their will, and and they're really upset about it. And I said, "Hang on, this was an assistant commissioner that took hang on." So I gave him an explanation. I also spoke to my counterpart at the Home Office, who I, I actually um, went out with socially quite a lot and got on very, very well with, who was horrified that, that this was being said. And I also spoke spoke to um, a, a member of an, the other, really the other key agency that he mentioned. A manager from that of that person came to me, approached me and said, I'm horrified to hear that this is being said because we've got a really good working relationship. And I said, well, would there be anyone in your organisation who might have said that? Could you go and find out? And he said he would. And he came back and he said, I've checked. No one said that. And I said, well, you go and tell that ma my manager then, which he did. And he said that person, that manager had said, thank you. A couple of months later, I had another ambush meeting where I was called in and I was told that the previous boss, who was now his boss, had said, you need to leave this command if you want promotion. And I'd said, but I don't want promotion. I enjoy the work that I'm doing. I believe it's important. That ended the conversation. A week later, he phoned me and said, he has said you've got to leave anyway. I think it's because of the briefing the mayor. Now, obviously, he'd already had the facts from people. And I, I made that point to him. And then I later got a paper copy of a report saying that I was being moved for um, unspec unspecific operational um, experience development. Now, for the last two years, I've been asking for development <laughs> and it hadn't <laughs> been there. And suddenly it was being used, development, development again, which wasn't being specified, was being a, used as a rationale to move me out of my role. Um, I sat on it for a week and then I asked to go and see a deputy assistant commissioner um, in line with the grievance procedure. Before you took out a grievance, you need to go and see a manager of it. Would you manage you had the grievance back, you had to go above them. Well, obviously I got two sets of management above me involved in this. So I had to see a deputy assistant commissioner. Um, she put me in to see her in a, a week later. When I went to see her, it became quite obvious that she'd prior to that meeting, undertaken a backdoor investigation and gone to see both of the bullies. And to every point I raised, she sat there with her arms crossed, looking at me with contempt and said, that's your view, that's your view, that's your view. Um, and as I lost the will to continue, she then turned around and said, um, I, you know, have you, um, I, yeah, I lost the will to continue. I'd started with the, the incident of the first manager I never got round to the second manager. She did mention his name, but I said, well, things things within working support have been better. I haven't had so much obstruction, but I, I hadn't got the will to go in to talk about the bullying that go on because I was just being told that was my view and it was my, I was, it was my, I was the problem. Um, I had responded on the paper form <laughs> saying, um, that had said I needed to be moved for unspecified operational development. I'd responded and I'd said, well, for the last two years, I've been asking for development. I'm rather surprised about this um, because I've been given no development and now I'm being told I need to move on for one. With, with no development. And she said, at which point she said to me, can't you read? Which I thought was was pretty bad coming from a senior officer to someone at quite a senior level anyway. Um, and or to anyone, actually. Um, you know, we, we do have an educational system in the UK, um, but she said, she said quite condescendingly, can't you read? And I said, oh, yes, I can. And it doesn't, it says here, um, operational experience. I said, what operational experience? I have a wider portfolio of um, tasks and, and different types of policing within my portfolio of the command than any of my peers who have been here for longer than me and are very, very specific, and none of them have been asked to move on. Um, I said, so what operational experience do I need? At which point she said to me, night duty. Well, as you can imagine, with 26 years in the police, <laughs> I'd seen plenty of night duty. And she told me, um, 
a regulation of investigatory powers authorizing officer, which I'd done lots of times as well. Uh, and I gave up. I mean, I went into that meeting broken because of the, the bullying. But by the time I left that meeting, I was destroyed because everything that I'd seen or believed about the organization and its culture and its fairness, the police codes of ethics, um, the encouragement to speak up and challenge things that were wrong, the values, um, they'd all been corrupted by a senior leader, you know, someone very near the pinnacle of the organization who had just scrubbed it all by not listening with empathy, um, having prejudged the outcome of the meeting, as far as I was concerned, they prejudged the outcome of the meeting before I'd even got in there. They weren't willing to explore or investigate. Um, and that's you what, weren't that's, valued. What, that's... Yeah, that's, that's what destroyed me is because um, I realised then that the culture was corrupt and I could never ever trust anyone in a senior position. Although there are some very good leaders within the police, I could never ever trust anyone within a senior position if I could see someone turn in that way, someone who would would advocate the glossy magazine cover of here's the policy and we're such a fine organisation because this is what we do. But actually when, when that glossy magazine cover was inconvenient, when that policy was inconvenient, then to disregard it and, and head their own way, you know, to circumvent it. So, uh, so, so can I just stop you there for a moment, just for our listeners, because I want to point out something which I'm sure you'll agree with. Bullying tends to start where you're just made to feel really uncomfortable in your working environment. Yeah. You know, things go on that, hang on, I, I'm, I'm able to do that. I can go to my own meetings. I can. So, so it's not initially really obvious. It's just a difficult work environment where people are yeah. really getting in the way of you doing your job. And then it yeah. seems to slowly escalate and, and it escalates in a way that other people start to isolate you or, or literally pick on you for things that you know are not true. And they start to accuse you of things that don't even relate to the person that you are. Like you, you're thinking, hang on, that's not me. You know, it's a bit like a child, you know, stealing a lolly. And, and if you know your child stole the lolly, they'll usually say, I took the lolly. But if they didn't do it, they'll say, Daddy, I didn't do that. It's, it's that yeah. sort of feeling, isn't it? That, that, yeah. that you don't relate to it. And then it seems to get to the point when you're feeling fragile, you're stressed because work's not pleasant and you've got to watch your back, but you're not really aware of it to the degree until you confront it with a major, whatever it might be, in your case, it was a meeting, and you suddenly realise how set up you're being um, yeah. and, and that they want you out. This is your job. This is your livelihood. They're going to do whatever they are, but you're not sure how they can because, you know, how do they find there's a whole lot of stuff going on on in your head. And that's when the mental health things start to unravel. But that's what I hear as a pattern. Would that be yeah. what happened for you? Yes, it would. And it is. And it, the, the, the impact at that point was so devastating that whilst I followed the first bit of the procedure, in a grievance was go and see a, a yeah. line manager first of all because it, they should be able, they should be sorting this out um having not had any satisfaction from that and being destroyed i didn't have the the strength then to to move on i i acquiesced and just buried my head down um you know to for, uh, to avoid having it knocked off again and um and I was, I was moved into, I was then eventually I was moved into a sidelined over into another role very, very quickly, not immediately after that meeting, but I was literally one day I was told you're going tomorrow. Um, and I went off to do some temporary project work only to find that when I'd gone to that temporary project work, that deputy assistant commissioner had contacted a counterpart. And when I turned up there, I was told, you'll be okay here as long as you learn to speak to people properly. So I found, found those, those rumors yeah. and that harm had followed me again. 
and then when I moved, was moved into another position, again, I found those rumours from a bit of the mobbing that had been going on spread again. Um, and within 12 months, my confidence had gone from here. Well, it wasn't it wasn't right up here. By the time I'd had that meeting with her, it was sort of gone down here yeah, to the, yeah. you know, by the time I had a meeting gone down, destroyed. And then I just went right down the hill into to breakdown. Um, and eventually went sick with trauma, but just, well, I, I wasn't diagnosed as trauma at that time. Um, but uh, it was anxiety and depression and rumination, yeah. not being able to concentrate. But just before I went sick, I actually had a very good, I, I mean, I went through after this, I went through and had two really good line managers. And I've got to be really clear that within the Metropolitan Police Service where I was working, there were a lot of good leaders, but unfortunately what happened to me destroyed my trust in the concept of leadership within the organization. Um, and at that point I had two good managers. One of them had said to me, I really think you should put this through for a grievance, you know, for an investigation. It was a year later, which I did. But that didn't work properly either, because I saw some one is the person was obviously wasn't trained to deal with someone who was suffering the trauma, etc., and to elicit the full story. But secondly, I had said, I've got some witnesses, i.e. the people from these other government departments who are very, very pertinent to this. And he said, don't worry about that. I'll get that off you later. Well, he had I gave him my home email address. I went sick shortly after that and I was off for several months. When I came back from sickness, I opened my work email account to find an email saying, can you give him the details of those witnesses? And then, you know, which had been a couple of months beforehand. And also a final report that said, you know, Detective Superintendent Wilson never came back to me with the names of these witnesses. And I had an investigation that found against me. <laughs> um, which literally I, I returned from sickness after months and I went sick again the same day. You know, I mean, it just the whole thing is, um, it is, it's I, really, in, it's interesting, you know, Jonathan, because I have spoken to a, another ex police, um, officer in, in Sydney who was involved with, um, one of the public corruption scandals and he spoke up in another workplace and he said to me, um, that you know he'd been he'd been to some of the most incredible uh, investigations you know Port Arthur massacre all sorts of major traumatic incidences he mm. said but I've experienced nothing like this and and I think that's the thing that people don't understand as I say people are just being difficult or you know they're being snide or but they don't understand that that we go to work to earn a living, we're going to work to feel fulfilled. It's a very big part of who we are. And when people chip that person away and you lose trust in people around you, you're on high alert 24 seven. You can't even do your job. No. Well, I had to go, I had to go into um, police buildings occasionally. Whilst I was off sick, I had to go in to see occupational health because I went through initially I went through 10 weeks of CBT counselling I also um, had to at one point had to go up to the 20th floor to see a manager um, of mine I every time I went into that building it was like um, it was almost like a, a stealth commando approach I was going around and hiding behind lampposts and yeah. Um, cover of other buildings to approach that building to avoid seeing anyone not just people the few people who were involved in the bullying but anyone I had that anxiety I just didn't I couldn't cope with seeing anyone and then I'd get into a lift and that building was 27 stories high so I'd normally have got into a lift I didn't get into a lift I actually walked up 20 flights of stairs on two occasions to avoid seeing anyone in a lift yeah. um it was, it was, it was, I mean, it was awful. And, and the manager I had at the time, occasionally I met with him and he was very good most of the time. And he came out and met me and we went and met in a cafe out, you know, I, away from work, you know, um, in his sort of sickness monitoring of me. Um, but yeah, the anxiety was awful. And I, I was just shut down. And when I did come back to work, 
you know, having had quite a strategic mind and always being willing to, to look at um, a direction forward and what were the ifs and buts and the dangers and the advantages of things and is there anything ancillary that we could do as a run, along, run alongside, etc. My mind would always work like that. I just shut down. I just shut down. I couldn't, I could not concentrate to on anything. So I, I mean, I did I literally, I, 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 I spent a couple of years at work after all of this trying, you know, on and off from work and trying to recuperate and going through different forms of counseling and medical help, etc. But every time I went into work, I just couldn't um, work, um, couldn't concentrate. It wasn't for lack of trying. And um, usually after I'd been there for, for back for a few weeks or a few months, um, trying it just drove rumination and depression and i got worse and i was back off sick again you know so so at what point you were medically retired is that what happened or no i wasn't medically retired because i mean it was just it was just another battle i couldn't face you know everything had gone against me from the moment i'd seen that deputy assistant commissioner and she, you know it being it's your view it's your view and then a year later when i'd had that that you know that that hr ex hr employee um conduct that not not com entirely satisfactory investigation um and the fact that you know i was you know uh, what happened what often happens with this as a as a target of bullying you're by yourself and there's there's the mob that have come together you know the two managers another manager that wanted to support them because i actually saw a manager just before i moved out of that department i had to see another manager who sources su suggested that i um i should ask me to come and see her and when i sat with her and i'd never worked for her but i'd worked alongside her a few have seen it to me but i'd worked alongside her and I sat in with a meeting with her and I said, you know, and I was obviously visibly upset. And I said, this is ridiculous. All these things are being said. And I said, you know me for the last couple of years. Have you ever heard me speaking out of turn to anyone? And she said, no, but I've heard about it. You know, and it's, do you see what I mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, 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 um, so you, left, you left the police service, is that how? Yeah, because I'd, I'd, I'd have just ended up with another battle that I couldn't handle. If I'd tried to fight for, um, to go for a ill health pension, I'd have been there for, for ages and ages. And, 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 and you, you do know that's fundamentally what happens to everyone. People put yeah. in front, front of them so many obstacles and they're so fragile at that point in time that they just want yeah. out. That they just and and yeah. no one takes care of people when they're in that space. It's just it's mm -hmm. diabolical. No, and I, I think this happens with lots of organisations, but I see it happen with the police. The police leadership feel um, with with mental health. Oh yeah, we'll show we're doing something with mental health because we'll treat the symptoms. But what they're failing to address is treating the causation. And we always say that prevention is better than cure and they should be sorting out the causation, not, not trying to treat the symptoms. Yeah, have treat the symptoms if need be, if something falls through through the you know the safety net. But at the moment there is no safety net to that sort of stuff. No, that, not. the policy is is not it's not there. Um so yeah, I mean I, I left a year and a half earlier than my 30 years service because um yeah basically because i knew my health just wasn't gonna it couldn't yeah. take anymore i mean and if uh, you know there are people who are naysayers around bullying well you know if i put that in financial terms as a superintendent with the service i had as a superintendent when i retired if i'd retired with 30 years service i'd have been entitled to walk away with a lump sum of three hundred thousand pounds because I left a year and a half early, I walked out, walked away with just over a lump sum of just over a hundred thousand pounds, and I know I knew that that's what the cost was going to be, but my health had to come before before money. But as you can see, <laughs> yeah, the threat to my health is serious. To to swallow a loss of a couple of hundred thousand pounds is, is a big loss. Health. Is a big and how did it affect how did it affect your family? I mean, it strains every relationship you have. Well, I mean, I was fortunate. My wife, my wife was very um, 
very supportive. But she did actually say to me the other day, she said to me the other day, she said, did you ever think when you were at your worst that you were going to, you were, you'd ever see the light of day and come out of it? And I said, well, I sort of hope so. And she said, she said, because I didn't think you ever would come out of it. Um, That's stupid. And I had, and I've got a, I've got a daughter now who's 12 years old. Well, when this happened, she was five years old. Mm. Um, and I, uh, I, I actually wrote a letter to that deputy assistant commissioner when I left. And I said, uh, I, I was asked, asked them to reflect on how they'd worked and got quite a, quite a, quite a, well, I'd be, originally I was going to leave earlier, but then the organisation said they wanted to put me through trauma counselling because a psychiatrist had said I was suffering from complex PTSD. So I did um, several months of trauma counselling. So I actually stayed on beyond having written this letter to this deputy assistant commissioner asking her to reflect on how she treated people who came with allegations of bullying so I've been telling her the impact it had on me and in that time I got an email back while I was <laughs> going through this trauma counseling I went into trauma counseling one day absolutely livid and upset and the anxiety and everything coming back because she sent me a letter back basically denying having said any things that she said in that meeting and then saying, and I remind you, the fairness at work um, investigation found against you and you were in the wrong, um, implying I was in the wrong. So I'd sent another one to her again when I left saying, well, actually, I, I you know, I happen to disagree with you. And there were all there were all these flaws. One is, you know, Dr. Gary Namey, a, a, a leading researcher in workplace bullying has said HR aren't the best people to investigate this. You know, he he and I don't quite hold with this, but he because I think there are HR managers that are sympathetic, but he, he describes HR as the black ops of the, um, of management, i.e. they do in the bidding and management. He, um, but also that this HR manager was previously an employee of the organization was so by no means was independent that he hadn't taken the names of those witnesses. And the very fact that, um, when it's one against three or one against four, um, you know, there's a weight of evidence, apparent evidence, mm, uh, mm. is it is imbalanced. And also, I said it didn't help that there, it, from reading reading his uh, investigation, that common phrases that are used by bullies when when investigations take place of, I don't recall that, I I'm not quite sure, I don't remember, or I was only trying to help them, you know, which are. <laughs> Are quite yeah. common, yeah, quite so common. How, so so how, long ago, how long ago was this? This was in, um, well, this, the, that bullying started in 2013 and went through and all the way into 2014. Right. So all that damage in, in over 12 months, it's quite incredible, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Well, it was, oh, oh, it was over 12 months. It was nearer to two years. And right. then, of course, the following year where these rumours... Yeah. Yeah, we're, yeah. We're, we're pushed on. Um, yeah. So, so, I, so, my, so, sorry, the point I was going to say in that letter was that I also said to that woman in the letter, I do not want to hear from you again. I have a five year old daughter. I have a daughter who was five years old when this happened to me. And for the last five years, she hasn't seen a father who has smiled. Um, I'm starting a new life now um, and she deserves better. But yeah, that's the impact. It, that's the impact it had. You know, my daughters had to go through through uh, five year old daughters had to go through five years who had a father who's at times has barely spoken in the house. Yeah. So so have before we sort of I'm conscious of time. Um, yeah. Before we sort of wrap, ha, have you been able to put it behind you? I mean, one of the the difficulties I find with bullying survivors, bullying victim survivors is the injustice of it is really difficult to come to terms with. Yeah. Yeah, no, you're right. And the thing is having, 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 I mean, I've done a lot of risk. I couldn't find any, um, I, I mean, there's a massive LinkedIn network there now. Um, and I'm part of it, supporting people who are uh, in raising awareness and uh, um, supporting people who are experiencing bullying. But I didn't have any of that time, so I had to really crawl my own way through. And one of the things I did was I did a lot of reading on, on workplace bullying to understand, and it was really enlightening. 
Secondly, I went back and I kept a, I kept rewriting my story as rumination took place. Trauma never ever leaves you. You learn to manage it, which I have learned to manage. But I still have very very dark days of rumination. Come back at every so often. I, you know, there's no planning in it. I don't know when it's going to happen. It happens, and it really drives me down. And it's that, like, yeah. And I suspect that's something I'm going to carry with me for the rest of my life because it's been going on for years. Well, it's uh, it's pretty much the same for everyone, but I think you've hit on a really important point. It's really only relatively recently, and and LinkedIn's a really great example of it. Is that there there is an uprising of of, of victims going on that are gathering together, and there are ad- advocates as well. But there's noise happening that people are beginning to educate themselves. There's now research and evidence base where the, the, the psychologists are coming together. And it's going to change because you can see it coming over the horizon. It's like it is a behaviour that is unacceptable and, and organisations need to intervene before it starts impacting people's health. And I think you'll agree, given, you know, you curate some wonderful things on LinkedIn. Yeah. And there's a really, I mean, there's a really interesting point as well is, you know, governments are ignoring this. And I, I, I mean, I wrote to a local MP recently about workplace bullying and he came back with a stock in trade answer, which they released through the Department for Trade and Industry in the UK that says, you know, the government ab- abhors the idea of workplace bullying, but strongly believe that the best way to tackle workplace bullying is for employers to have responsible policy and, in, and put training in place. So I counter that argument by saying, if employers are so, I can be trusted so much, why have the government in this country introduced equality legislation? And I've got no problem with equality le- legislation. Um, for people who, who ha- um, have um, um, the, the characteristics that would fall with the special characteristics which would fall within equality, you are able to use that to action having been bullied at work anyone who doesn't have it is unable to use that which leaves a massive gap but also why have they introduced the legislation on health and safety as well if employers are so responsible they can be trusted about in creating a safe work environment you know where um mm. free from psychological assault um why why aren't they being trusted around equality and why aren't they being trusted around health and safety you know if they're so mm. responsible and I feel the government are actually using that as, you know, as clever words because they are, they fear um, the floodgates of litigation being broken. But Absolutely. legislation Absolutely. legislation shouldn't be about enabling litigation. It should be a consequence of a breach. But litigation should be about setting rules that people, uh, you know, adhere to. And they, companies have done that with health and safety. And to the best part, most of the time, they have done it around equality as well. Yeah. So, so um, these days, how do you manage your own self-care? You know, you're obviously really conscious of your own health. OK, so, yeah, I, I still do. I still do a fair amount of reading. Um, I, um, I have for years done. Uh, I have for years um, um, practiced Taekwondo. Unfortunately, during coronavirus, uh, because it's a close contact sport, I haven't been able to do that. Um, but I have a border collie. If anyone knows border collies, they need a lot of exercise. And I live in the countryside now, so I probably walk sort of eight to ten miles a day. Um, I love um, building and craft, so I do a lot of woodwork. Um, I have in the place we live now. I've got my own workshop, so I do a lot of woodwork. Um, I do a lot of building, and. Um, and I've got other projects. I've just bought an old boat, which I'm intending to strip down and re-gel coat and put a new deck on this um, this summer. Um, so I do lots of things like that. Um, it's, it's great. My daughter's at a young age where we get, to, you know, she's 12 years old now. Um, she's She's got the same inkling as me for, you know, crafts and things like that. So she likes making things. Um, she's also a very, very good cook. So she's always cooking and um, I help her with that because I enjoy cooking as well. Um, it's good to take her out on dog walks and stuff. 
And, you know, when, when at a time during the summer when the restrictions were lifting, we go out kayaking because we're in Cornwall. We're near to the water. So we go out kayaking and paddle boarding and sailing. Um, and uh, because we've got quite a bit of land here now as well where we, we, we live, um, I've put in a hundred, uh, again, another building project for me, but I've put in a hundred meter long zip wire. So oh, that's wow. always good fun. Good yeah. fun to put her on. And then, and then the dog chases her as she's zipping <laughs> down on it. So, so you, yeah. obvious, you obviously manage to build other interests in your life and you're conscious of them. Yes, yes. So, yeah, I've got lots, lots, lots going on and stuff. Um, it never ever contact. It will never ever combat those those dark days when that rumination comes back. I just can't. You can't switch off from it. The only way you switch off is when you you've actually fallen asleep and somehow it yeah. goes and then you wake up. But mindfulness and stuff like that doesn't work for me with when that rumination comes. But it's yeah, I yeah. I mm. I personally find, and I say to people, music is gr is great mood changer. Um, because mm. you just, if you've got an emergency playlist of um, yeah. of music that lifts your spirit, even if you've got to fake it until you make it, um, you, yeah. and you say, oh, oh it's that emergency playlist, but it does change your mood, and there's a lot of evidence for, for having that. Yeah. But, yeah. So, so, and then the last question, I guess, and I ask everyone, with all of that, have you, you've obviously thought deeply about life. What does spirituality now mean to you in all of this? Well, I think I think that life's really, really precious. And um, my advice to people is, as you know, is, uh, is, you know, if you see this coming, edu educate yourself about this. You see, if you see this coming, get out of the situation. Um, you know, I mean, it took me some time. I had no education about this and I didn't realise the harm that was being done until it had actually really struck me. But life's short. And um, and, and I read stories of people who've you know committed suicide and i can you know following this sort of experience and i can understand why um i remember walking actually walking over blackfriars bridge one day and thinking you know the wall is you know that goes across the thames and the wall is quite low and thinking crikey it might be easier for everyone if i jumped over i i wasn't going to but the thought just mm. went through my head so you can understand how people take that other step so but i think i think i think I've always, and I've always held by this, that, uh, and this is probably the best advice, is it doesn't matter how bad it is now, if it's this bad, things can only get better. So mm -hmm. don't give up. Try and withdraw yourself from the situation you're in, if you can. But if things are really this bad, then they can only go better, you know. Uh, they can only get better. Yeah. Thanks for joining us, Jonathan. Okay, that's your welcome. <laughs>